Live. Facebook Live. From Medina. At the boat dock. Uh, no, we're not at the boat dock. Oh, the Erie Canal. Yeah, yeah, but behind Captain Kids. You think we need a new monologue? Um, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. Okay. Okay. How you doing? Good. How are you doing? Pretty good. good. You look lovely good. as always. Did you have a good day? I'm a very blessed person. How was your day? Good. Good. Did you build a lot of things? I built some big things. Built big things. Big things. Awesome. Well, that's yes. fun. Yes. We build big things around here. And my wife, she's a stabber. She stabs people. Oh. Wait, that sounds bad. See, she, she's see, a phlebotomist. The, oh, I was going to see if they could guess. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, that, that was worded wrong, everybody. <laughs> okay, she draws people's blood for a living. Yes, I do. You don't give it back? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I almost called you a whatever. Oh. Anyways, we got a Bible study. <laughs> oh, man. She's a good woman. Anyways, we got a Bible study. We are going to talk about how do we read the Bible. Okay. What's the influence behind how we read it? Oh. Yes, very important, very important. Oh. Uh, I guess we want to say hi to some people. Yes. Yes, anybody you want to start with? Uh, your mom's here. Hi, Mom. Hey, Mom. I know Cindy's here. I know David uh, Sherwood's coming. Yes. Keeley's coming. Dolores is coming. Yes. All our happy folks are coming. Did you say Cindy or yeah, you did? Yeah, we said hi to Cindy. Ah, uh, okay. So, we're going to start a Bible study. If we don't say your name, it might be that we just don't remember or don't know that you're here. So, thank you for coming, and I say we pray. Okay, well, let's... Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we stop and thank you for this opportunity to serve. And so, as we pray, Lord, we just recognize you as the source of love, truth, and freedom. And that we understand and recognize our complete dependence on you in this moment. So we thank you for this opportunity. And just ask that you would speak through us. That you would pour your spirit into us in an exceedingly great measure. And that you would speak your truth through us. So we believe, we have faith, we have trust. Doesn't matter how many Bible studies we do, we need you every time. So we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity. And may you be blessed in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we got a Bible study, and the Bible study is uh, kind of like, how readest thou? Jesus asked somebody that question. How readest thou? Thank you very much for the Bible. You're welcome. How readest thou? What is written in the law? And that's the main emphasis of today. How do we read the Bible? We read the Bible a very specific way. We focus on God's love, we focus on the life of Christ, and we allow Scripture to explain itself. If you've come to Bible studies with us, probably more than once, <clears throat> you know we hit some basic fundamentals. And this is to establish a goal. This goal is to see agape. This goal is to eat from the tree of life. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. This is the basis for the Bible studies that we do for a long time now. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says this. He that loves not knows not God, for God is love. This love of God is agape. This is a word that means complete self-control. Completely considering others more important than God considers himself. This is how God is. Psalm 18, verse 30 says that God is perfect. And Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says that God is unchangeable. So God's love, where he considers others more important than he considers himself, where he has self-control, it has to be perfect, and it has to be unchangeable. We do use three core fundamental Bible study principles. And this Bible study principles is, number one, that God is love. This is our focus. The second Bible study principle we use is that Jesus is the ultimate revelation of what the Father is like. Not just by telling us, but by actually living it out. And the third Bible study principle we use is Isaiah 28.10. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. We look at the each Bible study topic as a puzzle. And precept is a biblical principle. It's a divine principle. 
and divine principle must be on divine principle and scripture tells us what divine principles are and divine principles helps us filter how to read the bible so these three things god's love jesus is the ultimate revelation of the father and that scripture explains scripture this is how we approach every single bible study and last time we talked about two trees a very important Bible study. If you haven't checked that one out, go and look at what we talked about on YouTube, Brad Mock Bible Studies, about the two trees in the Garden of Eden. And what we saw was that there were really two systems, right? We saw that the tree of life was Jesus and the government of agape. And we saw that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was Satan and his government of iniquity. The tree of life was God's system. It was patterned on the life of Christ, and it provides to mankind love, joy, peace, freedom, truth, self-control. And when you look at the fruits of the Spirit, which was hanging from the tree of life, we see that we receive all of agape in its completeness. This is what happens when you eat from the tree of life. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil was Satan's system of iniquity. And we saw that it was a system of reward and punishment. Be good to those who are good. Be evil to those who are evil. And this system of reward and punishment, this causes mankind to compete within itself. And this competition between man, woman, man, man, this is where lies come from. This is where deception comes from. This is where corruption envy, greed, hatred, selfishness, violence, murder. This is where it comes from. And this is where good works come from as well. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. So there were two trees, and each tree had fruit. Proverbs 18, 21. Here we go. Proverbs 18, 21 says this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. The tree in the garden that you love, the system that you love, is the fruit that you'll eat. If you love the tree of life, if you love agape, if you love God's system, that's the tree that you'll eat from. But if you love evil, corruption, if you love twisting good, then you'll eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because that's the fruit that you want to eat. And the fruit of the tree that you eat ultimately determines how you view God. If you eat from the tree of life, you will view God in agape. Now, this is very important because in the world today, in the Christian world today, there's two drastic views and they're like miles apart from each other. If you view God as agape, then his anger, his wrath, his justice, his judgment, his vengeance will be understood through agape. That's very important. If you eat from the tree of good and evil, and you think that God has a system of reward and punishment, then you'll view God's anger, God's wrath, God's justice, God's judgment, God's vengeance, that will be understood through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and that will be a system of iniquity. So if you focus on the tree of life, Jesus, and you look at God's anger, wrath, vengeance, justice, judgment, you'll see God's love displayed in every one. But if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when you look at those things, you're going to view God as a God of iniquity. And this is why a lot of people can't, see the truth of God's anger, the truth of his wrath, the truth of his judgment. is because they eat from the wrong tree. And what we see in the Bible is that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, they were together in the midst of the garden. And we see that the two systems, God's system of agape and Satan's system of iniquity, they are together in the Bible. Now that sounds crazy, but we got to think about it. Two trees side by side in the garden, two systems, a system of agape and a system of iniquity. They're both in the Bible side by side. And really, this is the great controversy, right? One tree 
symbolizes God, truth, his government, his methods, his principles. The other tree represents Satan's system, his government, his method, his principles. Both of these systems, side by side in the garden and side by side in the Bible, there's a very specific reason why God allows this. And the reason is that so that we can understand what the great controversy is all about and pick a side. Psalms 34 verse 8 says this. Psalm 34 verse 8 says this. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Taste and eat from the tree of life and you will see how good agape is. If you eat from the tree of life, you will experience God's agape love. If you eat from the tree of good and evil, you will experience Satan's deadly poison. Job 20.12 Job 20.12 says this, Though the wickedness be sweet in his mouth, though he hide it under his tongue, though he spare it and forsake it not, but shall keep it within his mouth, yet his meat in his bowels is turned, and it is the venom of snakes within him. Yeah, very important. The fruit of the tree of good and evil may seem sweet in the mouth, but it's actually snake venom. And these two systems, side by side in Scripture, God allows this so that we can have equal access in Scripture to both sides of the great controversy, so that we can taste the fruit of the tree and pick a side. This is how the mind of God works. Right? God gives complete and absolute freedom to both sides to present their case so that we can examine the truth of both sides, so that we can understand both sides, and so that we can ultimately make a choice which side we will stand on. That choice is for us to make. And we have to be very careful because Satan's deceptions are so convincing that he will make his goodness... Satan will make his goodness seem like God's goodness. But Satan's goodness is not good at all. Because it's corruption, it's lies, it's force, it's manipulation, it's murder. It's the twisting of the truth in such a way that you don't actually see it twisting. That's the deception that Satan's master mind of evil does. Satan's goodness is not good at all. Because it does not have agape in it. And so we see Satan's principles being displayed in scripture. We sure do. Right in our faces. And we think that it's God doing it. And just a quick example. You see in scripture killing lots of people in God's name. Including babies. Sending fire from heaven to destroy man. And because it has God's name on it, we attribute that to God. And we twist things in our mind so that what is bad becomes good so that God doesn't become some sort of evil person. But there's a lot of bad stuff that happens in the Bible in God's name. And we don't necessarily understand that Satan is playing a deception and that he's trying to get God a bad reputation. And so we justify in our mind, from a carnal perspective, bad things that happen in God's name. And we will say, well, God did this in a loving way. Everything in the Old Testament, we think God is acting one way. Harsh, critical, mean, and judgmental. But as soon as you get to the New Testament... It's all of a sudden God changed his ways, and now he's acting kind, loving, patient, and merciful. But God does not change. God is agape. He's perfect. And so God of agape in the New Testament is God of agape in the Old Testament. If God changed, the Bible said he's the same today, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So either God was using force, manipulation, and violence in the Old Testament, or he wasn't. It's just a fact. 
force, manipulation, violence, that's iniquity. That's just a plain fact. We did a Bible study on what iniquity was. We saw that it was force, manipulation, and violence. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says that there is no iniquity in God. So God can never force. He can never manipulate. He can never use violence because that's Satan's system. So either God was using force, manipulation, and violence in the Old Testament, or something else was happening in God's name. That's very important. Because if God wasn't using force, manipulation, and violence, something else was happening in his name, planting the principle of good and evil in Scripture to pervert our view of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 says this. <clears throat> and from a child thou hast known the... I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's important, to be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 says, Be strong, but strong meat belongs to them that are full of full age, even to those who by reason of use have their senses exercised, to discern both good and evil. These passages are very important, right? To rightly divide the word of truth and have your mind exercised so that you can rightly discern between good and evil. This, these two passages put an emphasis on the importance of understanding God's word. There's a physical reality that tells of a spiritual truth so that we can discern the difference between good and evil. And how can you discern between good and evil unless are both placed side by side for examination? That's the only way. That's very important. And we're going to see why God allowed this to take place in Scripture. So good and evil have to be placed side by side in one place, just like the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Both God's system and Satan's system are placed side by side so that God can teach us how to discern good from evil so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. Both have to be in Scripture, both of them. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's important. That all scripture is given by inspiration of God and there's a profitness in it. Like it's profitable for something. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says this, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The scripture is inspired by God. And as the Holy Spirit moved upon men, they wrote. Now the Bible says something very specific that helps clear these passages up. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. God, who at different times and in different ways spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Clearly, when God had inspired the word and the Spirit moved upon holy men, God had spoken to us through the prophets in different times and in different ways. This is very important. God allowed the writers of the Bible to write things as they were, true historical events that were absolutely influenced by the Holy Spirit. But they were tainted. And that, 
don't leave the Bible study. Listen to what I have to say. Hear this next part, because all of the Bible study, all of the Bible writers were tainted with their own understanding, their own culture, their own background, their own experience. They all had their own view of God. Moses was one of the closest people ever to God. And he, even he asked God to show him his glory because he didn't know what it was. It was very important. And I know it sounds bad in this moment, but none of the Old Testament writers had a perfect understanding of God. And we got to face the reality of how could they, right? God is infinite and the carnal mind is limited to what it knows, what it has experienced, and what it can understand, right? The carnal mind cannot fully grasp an infinite God. And I'm not talking bad about the old uh, people who wrote the Bible. I'm not saying anything bad about the Bible. What I'm saying is, is there was a clear influence of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil on the minds of people as they were writing. And we're going to see that in a minute. This is why we need Jesus. Not just to forgive us of our sins and all that beautiful stuff, but Jesus is the only one that's capable of teaching us the truth of how to read the Bible. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who at different times and in different manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. That's very important. There was a time when God spoke to us in different ways and at different times, but now he speaks to us through his Son. This is probably the most important facet of the Bible study, is that we need Jesus to tell us what the Father is like. John chapter 10, verse 15. John chapter 10, verse 15 says this. As the Father knows me, even so know I the Father. This is important because the mind of God is infinite. He knows all things. And Jesus is saying that the mind of infinity knows me. Even so, I know the Father. So Jesus knows who the Father is. Matthew eleven twenty seven. Matthew eleven twenty seven, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knows the Son but the Father. Neither knows any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. It's impossible for mankind to know what the Father is truly like unless the Son reveals him to us. That's very important. John 17, 4. John 17, 4. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self and with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have made known thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. This is Jesus' work. The work that Jesus was given by the Father was that he might make known the name of God. 1 Samuel 25, 25 says, As his name is, so is he. So the work that Jesus came to do was to reveal the truth of the character of God. This is so important. We look at Jesus and we think that he was just a sacrifice so that the Father would no longer be angry. But the work of Jesus was to tell us the truth of what God is really like. Matthew chapter 7, verse 29. Matthew, 20, uh, Matthew 7, 29. Here we go. Matthew 7, 29 says this. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So when Jesus teaches, he teaches as one that has authority. 
And we think of it like, okay, what was Jesus' authority? And you can absolutely say that it was the miracles he did. That gave him authority. You can say that it was the truths that he spoke, that that gives him authority. You can say it was the credibility that he had and the character that he displayed. Now, all those things give Jesus authority that we should listen to him. But there's a passage in the Bible that gives Christ ultimate authority to teach us about the Father. And this is where the greatest weight of Christ's authority to teach us about the Father lays. And it's in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22. Now, some of, some of us know this passage is about wisdom and that Christ is the wisdom of God. So when it talks about wisdom, it's talking about Christ. And this is what it says. Proverbs 8.22 The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting. From the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no foundations abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth nor the ends of the field, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he had prepared the heavens, I was there. When he had set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea his decree, the water should not pass the commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was with him, as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him rejoicing in the habitable part of the earth and my delights were with the sons of men this is jesus christ with the father in eternity past seeing how the father operates his methods his character his principles christ was brought forth from the substance of the father's divine essence before anything was made christ was with the father Eternity past, Christ was brought up in the methods of agape, in the principles of agape, brought forth from the very divine substance of agape. Agape, divinity, has always been who Christ is. And before anything existed, Christ and the Father were Father and Son. Who better to tell us what the Father is like than he who was with him in eternity past, cooperating with him in creation. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'm almost there, almost there. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. That's Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. This is the weight of Jesus' authority to teach us of the Father. Jesus is complete divinity. Jesus was there from the beginning, brought up in the system, methods, and principles of agape. This is where Christ gets his authority and is able to teach us about the Father because he's the only one that truly knows what God is like. Matthew 23, verse 8. You know what I think I'm going to do? Mom? I think I'm going to turn this up right here because okay. I can't read. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Matthew 23, verse 8. I, my eyes ain't that good at night. Matthew 23, verse 8. Here we go. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. What is a rabbi? That's a teacher. You have one teacher. That is Christ. That's very important. Because when we want to get to know the truth about God, there's all different kinds of sources and manuscripts and writings where we go to and we get to know about God. All those things are just fine. But those things are secondary to Jesus and the life and revelation that he has about the Father. 
Only Jesus can teach us the truth about God. And if you're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that will be your perspective as you go and read other writings. So you have to be very careful. This is why we see Jesus saying things like, You have heard it said in the Old Testament, but I say unto you, because now Jesus is giving us a revelation of what the Old Testament actually is. This is very important. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, You have heard it said, but I say unto you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, You have heard it said, but I say unto you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, You have heard it said, but I say unto you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Matthew chapter 5, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time. That is the fathers. That is the prophets. That is the Old Testament. Again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. What does forswear mean? We're going to see in a moment. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yes, yes, or no, no. For whatsoever more than these comes from evil. Jesus is teaching here us about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and he says do not forswear thyself the word forswear means to give something up right and that sounds funny in this moment but we've all been in this moment where we say god if i give something up will you give me a blessing now we we got to think about it and realize when we say, God, I want to offer you something to receive a blessing, that's a bribe, right? And because the system of agape doesn't give bribe, doesn't receive bribes, the system of agape freely gives blessings to good and evil. When we offer a bribe to God, Jesus is saying that comes from Satan's system. He's saying that that is evil because offering bribes to God, that's iniquity. That's part of a system eating the tree of the knowledge of the good of and evil. That's not how agape operates. And Jesus says, don't do these types of things. So we see Jesus taking a systematic approach to dismantling the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in his Sermon on the Mount. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount, that is a systematic demantling, dissembling, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and he's then teaching you how to eat from the tree of life Jesus is revealing a system of iniquity hidden in the tree of good and evil and he's telling us not to use that system Jesus is our only teacher and I know that a lot of people like to go to certain writings and I'm not against that I'm just saying be careful because if you're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and you're going to other writings you're going to have the perspective of Satan on those writings. So you got to be very careful. Only Jesus can give us the absolute truth about God, his character, his methods, his principles. And Jesus asks a certain lawyer a question. And Jesus asks us the absolute same question. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 says this, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, This is Jesus talking back to the lawyer. What is written in the law? How readest thou? So Jesus is asking the lawyer, What's your perspective on Scripture? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And, he, and Jesus said unto the lawyer, Thou hast answered right. Do this, and thou shalt live. 
but he willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? So clearly, in the mind of this lawyer, we see two trees. Jesus said to him, What's in the scripture? How do you read it? How did he answer? He answered with agape. He said, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. That is agape. And then something else takes place in the mind of this lawyer. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil provoked him to justify himself. That's important. The battle of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life taking place in the mind. And Jesus asks us the same exact question. How readest thou? What is written in the law? What perspective do you have? What tree influences your mind? Do you see a God of love and mercy? Do you see a God of agape? Or do you see a God of good and evil who rewards and punishes? Very important. 2 Timothy chapter 3.15 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 says this, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So Paul is talking to Timothy, and he's saying, You've known the holy scriptures since you were a child. That's the Old Testament. That's very important. Timothy had the Old Testament, and he was made wise unto salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. So knowing the Old Testament and having that understanding can make us wise unto salvation, but the key is through faith in Jesus Christ. John chapter 5, verse 39 John chapter 5, verse 39 says this, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here. And they have the same Old Testament that Timothy had. Timothy was wise unto salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. The Pharisees were not not able to become wise unto salvation because there was no faith in Jesus Christ. We have two groups of people. This is the great controversy. This is the battle between good and evil playing in the hearts and minds of men. Two groups, both with the Old Testament. One group is made wise unto salvation. The other group is not made wise unto salvation. Timothy and Paul become wise unto salvation because the Old Testament was filtered through Jesus Christ, the tree of life. The Pharisees did not become wise unto salvation because the Old Testament was filtered through Satan and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm going to prove it. John chapter 8 verse 13. John chapter 8 verse 13 says this, the Pharisees, Jesus and the Pharisees are having a conversation now. John chapter 8, verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself, thy record is not true. Then there's a whole long conversation that takes place, and ultimately Jesus responds to the Pharisees this way. You are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a, a liar and the father of it. Clearly, Jesus is saying to the scriptures, this is very important, to understand that the Old Testament can make us wise unto salvation, but that has to be filtered through Jesus Christ and the principles of the tree of life. Full and full. Oh, here we go. Well, thank God for that. We're huh? back. Okay. Yeah, I think I stopped you before you went too far. Oh, thank you very much. All right, so basically what we see here is that John and Timothy, or Paul and Timothy, their understanding of the Old Testament is filtered through Jesus. This causes them to become wise unto salvation. 
the Pharisees understanding of the Old Testament was filtered through Satan this causes them not to become wise unto salvation the Old Testament reading has to be filtered through faith of Jesus which is the tree of life second Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. When we have the filter of Jesus purifying what the scriptures truly mean, all scripture becomes profitable for doctrine. That's teachings. All scripture becomes profitable for reproof. Reproof is finding fault for a moral wrong. If there wasn't more wrong in the scriptures, you wouldn't need to be reproved. And essentially what I'm saying is that there's satanic principles in the Bible that have God's name on it, and Jesus needs to be the filter so that we can see them and be corrected. Because all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and correction. Correction means you go from error to truth. That's very important. So that we can have instruction in, in righteousness. And essentially, we have teachings, we have corrections, so that we can be instructed in agape. This passage has to do with examining scripture so that you can find both the principles of agape and the principles of iniquity. That's very important to understand that there's a tree of life in the scriptures which tells us the truth about God, that's Jesus. And there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the scriptures that tells us lies about God and that's Satan and they're both in the same place. And Jesus gives us his filter so that we can escape the lies of Satan. The only way to understand scripture so that we can be instructed in the ways of righteousness, which is agape, is through Jesus Christ, the tree of life. When we do not filter scripture through Jesus, something very bad happens, right? If you don't filter scripture through the tree of life or Jesus Christ, there's only Satan and the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when you read scripture through Satan's lies and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means that you look at God as a rewarding and punishing God, then scripture becomes unprofitable for doctrine because you're believing the lies of Satan. Then scripture becomes unprofitable for reproof because you're not able to see the moral fault then scripture becomes unprofitable for a correction because Satan will never lead you to the truth. And scripture becomes unprofitable for instruction in righteousness because Satan's lies about God and his system of iniquity will never lead you to agape. We got to be very careful to let Jesus be the filter of how we read scripture. And what happened to the Pharisees is them filtering the Old Testament through the satanic lies and the reward and punishment system. And they ended up having scripture not profitable for doctrine, not profitable for reproof, not profitable for correction, not profitable for instruction in agape. That's literally what happened with the Pharisees. Luke 24, 44. Luke 24, 44, says this. Here we go. Luke 24, 44. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us through that crazy moment. But God is with us. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Jesus, after he explained what the Old Testament was about, it was about him, it was about the truth, and it was about how God really is. 
after he explained that the Old Testament was about him, he then opened up their understanding, then he opened up their mind so that they could understand the scriptures. This is exactly what all of us need, an opening of the mind to understand scriptures. Only Jesus can do this. This is why we need to eat from the tree of life, because then we eat the truth about who really God is. It's very important. Now we're going to look in just a few passages. And now stick with me here. Because as I say, oh, we're going to see Satan's influence on Scripture. Right? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So there was a satanic influence on Scripture. I'm not against the Bible. I'm the Bible's number one fan. We want to realize, though, that the principle of iniquity rides through the Bible so that we can compare it with the system of agape, so we can examine it, so we can understand it, and so that we can make a decision on what side we're going to choose. 2 Samuel 24.1 2 Samuel 24, 1 says this, And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go and number Israel and Judah. So this scripture says that God was angry at David, and he provoked David to do something wrong so that he could punish Israel and Judah. Come on now. Is that how agape works? Because the Bible says that agape thinks no evil. Agape has no force, manipulation, or violence in it. So something's up here. First Chronicles 21 1. First Chronicles 21 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. See, when you see force or manipulation or coercion or causing somebody to sin so that they have a pretext to punish them, that's Satan. That is not God. God does not provoke people so that he can punish them. Satan provokes people to sin so that he can punish them. Psalm 137, verse 7. Psalm 137, verse 7. Here, here we go. Psalm 137, verse 7. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof, O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed. Happy shall he be that rewards thee as thou hast served us. Happy shall he be that takes and dashes thy little ones against a stone. Come on now. The Bible here is saying, Happy is he who takes the children of Babylon and beats them against a stone. Who inspired this? Did Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, inspire this passage? Would Jesus ever be happy with smashing baby on rocks? Come on now. It's not true. Satan inspired this passage by eating, by, I'm not saying the person who wrote this passage is not saved. I'm not saying that they weren't a prophet. I'm not saying that they weren't somebody that God used to help write scripture. What I'm saying is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil influenced how they wrote. Isaiah 45 verse 7. Isaiah 45, verse 7 says this, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. This is another passage where, obviously, a prophet of God does not have a full revelation of what the Father is like, right? Because God thinks no evil. And if God thinks no evil, how could he create something he never thought of? 
it's very important to understand. Am I saying that Isaiah was not a prophet? No. Am I saying that Isaiah was not a holy man? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying his understanding of God was limited. God used him to speak. But only Jesus knows what the Father is truly like. And we see limitations of the prophets in their understanding about God. Isaiah thought that all things come from God, both good and evil, so he wrote that. God allowed it so that we could have Jesus come along and be the filter of what true agape is. God allows both sides of the great controversy to be in one place. God allows both principles of both trees to be in the same place so that we can examine them, so that we can rightly divide the word of truth and discern good and evil. How many times in the Old Testament do we see people shedding blood in the Lord's name? You see that a lot. And we look at those passages and we think, well, it was good for those people to do those things because it was in God's name. But the truth of the matter is any form of goodness that has violence and murder in God's name, that comes from Satan. That comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That does not come from God. God does not tell people to smash babies on rocks. He does not tell people to use violence war, force, or manipulation. If you, you want to see how agape wages war, you want to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 11. I'm sorry, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 11. This is how agape wages war. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 11. Therefore, the heart of the king of Assyria was sore troubled for this thing and he called his servants and said unto them will you not show me which of us is for the king of israel and one of the servants said none my lord o king but elijah the prophet in israel tells the king of israel the words that you speak in your bedroom and he said go and spy where is he that i may send and fetch him and it was told him saying he is in dothan and we go on a few passages. And when they came down to him, Elijah prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote with blindness according to the word of Elijah. And Elijah said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass, when they came to Samaria, that Elijah said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see... And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elijah, when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And Elijah answered, Thou shalt not smite. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master and they and he prepared great provision for them and when they had eaten and drunk he sent them away and they went to their master and so the bands of syria came no more into the land of israel that's how agape wages war it feeds its enemies it gives drink to its enemies it's kind to those who despitefully use and persecute them. So all those times in the Bible where we see bloodshed, bloodshed, bloodshed in the name of God, that was not God's prompting. When you see times in the Bible when they're kind to the enemy, when they feed their enemy, when they give drink to their enemy, that's how you wage war with agape. Now we're going to look at Paul, right? Saul to Paul. And what we're going to see is when we look at Paul, when, when he was Saul, he was eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When he became Paul, he began eating from the tree of life. And he says this himself, not in these literal words, but when you put the puzzle pieces together, you see that prior to his conversion, Paul ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And after his conversion, he eats from the tree of life. 1 Timothy 1.13 1 Timothy 1.13 says this. 
Now, Paul's speaking about himself now, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So Paul says he was a blasphemer, he says that he was a persecutor, and he said that he was injurious, and that he did it in unbelief. We're about to read a passage that says that Paul was raised his whole life in the scriptures. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 says this. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. That should tell you something. Concerning the zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. So here Paul is talking about he was born in the right system. He had the right birth. He was a genius in the scriptures and he followed the written law very strictly so much that no one could blame him for anything. And, and yet he talks about this time of his life as a blasphemer and someone in unbelief. How can that be? If you're raised in the scriptures, if you're a genius in your memorization of the scriptures, how can you be blasphemous and an unbeliever? Well, we see the puzzle pieces start to fall together. Acts chapter 9, verse 18. Acts chapter 9, verse 18 says this. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received right away and rose and was baptized. So after Paul and his road to Damascus, he receives these scales on his eyes. After a certain amount of time, immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight, forthwith arose and was baptized. What are these scales a symbol of in the Bible? Job 41.15. There we go. Job 41.15. Um, maybe wait. Is it? Okay, you're good. Okay. Job 41.15 says this. What were the, the scales that were on Paul's eyes? I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Job 41.15 says this. His scales are his pride, shut up together with a close seal. Job is talking about Leviathan, that crooked serpent. And when we look at other passages, we see, because it seems fine on my end. So, Isaiah 27, 1. In that day the Lord with his sore and great strong shall punish Leviathan, the piercing servant, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon. Oh, That's all right. We're back. We trust Maybe. in the Lord. We are trusting the Lord. He, he's in control, not mm -hmm. us. So, Isaiah 27, 1. Leviathan is that crooked serpent. His scales are his pride. And when Paul had scales on his eyes, what does that mean? That means prior to Paul's conversion, he had a satanic view of God because he was, he was a Pharisee. He was eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is why he was taking part in killing Christians. Prior to Paul's conversion, he read the scriptures from the perspective of the tree of good and evil. And Paul saw in the Old Testament people killing people in God's name. And because it seemed good to kill people, who didn't believe the same as you, he did. Because he saw a God who used evil and violence to destroy the enemy, that's what he did. But he did it ignorantly, because he didn't know the truth about God. And he calls that time of his life unbelief. He had the scriptures. He knew there was a creator. But his view of God was satanic, and he was not following the one 
true God. But once Paul has a revelation of God through Jesus Christ, once Paul has a revelation of the Father through the tree of life, the scales fall from his eyes, his satanic view of God is taken away. So I'm going to go to Micah 4.5. I apologize about this, everybody, but there's nothing really to be sorry about because I can't control it. We're just trusting in God. So I'm going to Micah chapter 4, verse 5. Maybe we'll say another prayer, Lefa. Huh? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, okay. Micah 4.5. Let's see if I can find this little tiny book in the Bible. Jonah, Micah. Here we go. Micah 4, 5 says this. For all people will walk everyone in the name of his God. Come on now. We just talked about when you view God as a killer and that you see God as punishing evil, that ultimately, given the right circumstances, you will act out the same way. Because you're only doing what you think God himself would do. Micah chapter 4 verse 5 says, For all people will walk everyone in the name of his God. As his name is, so is he. For all people, everyone will walk in the character of his own God. And we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So the Bible predicts that how we view God is how we will act. All people walk in the name of their God. If you, the name of your God is a killer and a punisher and a rewarder, that's how you'll act. If your God is a God of agape, that is how you will act. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. Okay, here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're wrapping it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mightily through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. What is that thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God? That is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's Satan's system. That's what's against God. This, this is what has our minds in slavery. And bringing the mind and every thought of it into the revelation of the truth of God, into the captivity of obedience of Jesus, into a filter of understanding how God designed Scripture to be written through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Unless we look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, unless we look to Jesus, who is the tree of life, who is the truth about God, he is the only begotten divine replica of the Father. If we don't look to Jesus as the only teacher of the Bible, the only true source of love and truth, and the only true teacher of righteousness and agape in Scripture, and when we read scripture through the filter of Satan and a reward and punishment system and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, when we read the Bible, truth, righteousness, love, and Saturday. Hey, everybody. So here we go. So we're talking about how to read the scriptures. And we're having a lot of interruptions, but that doesn't matter because God is still good. He still gives us his truth, and he wants us to know that if we believe the lies of Satan, which are found in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which says that God uses a system of reward and punishment, then whenever we read the scriptures and we see truth, righteousness, and love, we'll understand that from a human carnal morality. And that understanding is corrupt, it's changeable, it's selfish. It's only when we have a revelation of the life of Christ and understand that what we see in Christ is exactly how the Father is. Then we'll read the scriptures in a completely different way. 
agape, Jesus, the tree of life, has to be our filter as we read the Bible. And the reason why so many people cannot accept certain truths about God, his character, his methods, and his principles is because their understanding of God in the scripture is based on the tree of good and evil. That's so important. I'm going to say it again. The main reason why people cannot believe the truth about God, his method, his character, and his principles is because their understanding of God is based on the principles of the tree of good and evil. They believe that God has a reward and punishment system and that any violence and murder and judgmental criticism against people in the Old Testament with God's name on it, they blame the Father. They don't understand that Satan has a counterfeit and that counterfeit has planted a seed in the minds of men that said God can never truly be agape. That's very important. These ideas that says that God manipulates, he forces, he kills, he destroys, these come from Satan. These are his principles. And when you say God kills, when you say God kills with love, when you say that God destroys, when you say that God destroys with love, you are saying that God has iniquity. Because iniquity is killing, iniquity is destroying, iniquity is violence. And you're saying that God uses Satan's system and that God's government is based on a reward and punishment system. That's tree of the knowledge of good and evil thinking. Once these revelations come to us and we believe them and apply them to life, we can see through Satan's lies because Jesus has filtered our understanding about the one true God. God does not have a reward and punishment system. He doesn't use force, violence, or manipulation. He wants to save everybody. He's forgiven us of our sins completely, and nothing we can do can separate us from the love of God. Only Jesus can open our understanding of what Scripture tells us and what the Father is really like. And he does that with not just his words that he speaks. He does that with his life. This is important because Jesus forgives, heals, and uplifts. That means the Father heals, forgives, and uplifts. Jesus washed people's feet. That means the Father washes people's feet. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus ate with sinners. If you have seen Jesus eat with sinners, you know that the Father will eat with sinners. That's just a fact. Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus got punched, Jesus got spit in the face, and he forgave people. That's because that's exactly how the Father is, so that's exactly how Jesus is. And for as horrible as it sounds to say, spit in the face of God, I'm not saying to do that. I'm just saying that the heart of God is that those people who spit in God's face, and there are people that do that, he freely forgives them, and he doesn't hold it against them. That's a radical shift in our minds about who God really is. God allows Satan's deceptions to ride side by side with his truth in Scripture so that Jesus can come along and teach us how to tell the difference between the two. And when we think about it, we actually need God to allow this so that we can learn how to discern between good and evil, so that we can learn what goodness looks like, what agape goodness looks like, so that we can see what Satan's goodness looks like, which is iniquity, right? Learning the principles of the tree of life, learning the principles of divinity, its methods, its characters, its truths, its only found in Jesus. And Jesus explains to us what agape's methods, principles, and character are. Only Jesus can open this, open this up to our mind. And unless we're willing to leave an understanding of reward and punishment, and that God uses iniquity to punish people, we're never going to see the truth about God, because we're always going to believe the satanic lie of God, which is found in Scripture. Jesus is the opener of the mind. Jesus is the one who helps us to rightly divide the word of truth. Jesus is the only one that can show us how to discern between 
good and evil. Only Jesus can show us God's methods, God's principle, God's character, so that we can understand the great controversy and see Satan's principles, Satan's methods, Satan's character. And once Jesus opened our minds so that we can rightly divide the word of truth and discern between good and evil, we can choose the truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for carrying us through this. Lord, at your will, you have divine power over all stuff. So we thank you for being with us. We ask that the video would be not broken up so that we can transition this to YouTube. And we just thank you for the opportunity to speak. We thank you for speaking through us. We thank you for the truth, which the Bible is the truth, both when it tells about you and its truth when it talks about Satan. All scripture is inspired by God, both to be a revelation of you and to be a revelation of the evil one. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Help us to discern between good and evil. Finish your good work in us, Heavenly Father. Help us to be surrendered to agape in all its fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, if y'all made it up to this point, God bless you. That was a journey. Thank y'all. Good to see you, Helen. I love y'all. Good to see you, Kristen.